What's up, volleyball fans? I'm Darren Tipton, and welcome to the VB Adrenaline Podcast. Our podcast, we will dive deep into the heart of the game, bringing you the hottest topics, prospects, and a buzz surrounding prep and college volleyball, especially the world of recruiting. In each episode, our crew will spotlight rising stars who are shaking up the national game. Plus, we will serve you the scoop on current events that have coaches and fans talking courtside. Tune in for the episodes that spotlight tomorrow's college stars, new trends in the sport, plus interviews that will keep you informed on the explosion that is volleyball in the USA. You can connect with us on social media, Instagram at vbadrenaline.com underscore and Twitter at vbadrenaline. Be part of the conversation. Share your thoughts on your favorite players, prospects, and predictions by using hashtag VBAdrenaline. So grab a seat, volleyball fans, and get ready to dive into the world of spikes, sets, and serves with the VB Adrenaline Podcast. See you there. Welcome back. Today, I'm joined by Amy Pauley, and Amy is, first of all, a volleyball nut, and she's also a head coach of the Orlando Valkyries in the new at Real Pro Volleyball League. So, Coach, thank you for taking time today. Of course. I'm excited to be here. And yes, I'm a huge volleyball nerd. So I have no shame in that. That's all right. We talked uh, brackets earlier, and I told Coach that I have about a page of new terminology that you gave me that I need to look up to increase my IQ. So I appreciate you. Let me ask you, just give us a quick overview of Real Pro Volleyball, the league, the mission, and then we'll get into your role in your squad. Yeah, I, the mission is to bring volleyball to the U.S. Uh, professional league and provide opportunities to these women who are either graduating for college or want to come back home, an opportunity to play in front of their families and make a decent living while doing it. You know, treat it as this is a, a real professional league. You have arenas, you have fans, you have gear deals, a little bit of everything. And so it's been really fun to be a part of it. Uh, the inaugural season, we're right around the corner. But I just appreciate everything that the founders are doing to get us off the ground. And uh, the players are really excited. So my question, um, A, first would be how did this come about for you? How did the whole process interview that go? And then we'll follow up with what has it been like being on the ground floor of building a professional sports organization? It happened very quickly. I got an email from Cecile Renaud, who is our director of coaches. And she is the liaison for the league and hiring coaches, assisting coaches, and just changes within the league or things that maybe we are suggesting. She's been a great middle person for that. But she reached out. He asked if I would be interested. I said, absolutely. And about five days later, I knew that I was going to be the head coach. And so it was really fast. Um, honestly, I think part of it was my willingness to give up what I was doing for something new and unknown and take a risk on what this league was. And it's a no brainer to me. Um, it's been really fun being on the ground and seeing everything that goes in behind the scenes. I'm learning a lot from a business standpoint as well, which is great for my resume. And if coaching is ever something I'm ready to pivot from, but just, I just am really appreciative and grateful for the people that I'm around during this and the players that are willing to also take the risk and do it. And I see nothing but fortune in our future. So it, it's pretty cool. What have you, just give us an idea, some of the things that you've had to do in your role, putting the team together, but also the, getting the franchise year one up and ready to roll, fold and laundry, do, I mean, fold. <laughs> Have you done just a little bit of everything? It is really funny that you say that because we're, we have our first practice on Wednesday. And I would say one of the biggest things that I'm doing is teaching all of the people in our organization what volleyball players need. So I am really lucky because our team president has already launched teams before. But he's really come, he comes from a hockey background. And so he's done some NHL teams. He's done some minor league teams. But 
he doesn't know anything about volleyball. And so when we're like going through the checklist of this, is like the best example I can give is I was giving a, one of our community leaders a snack list for our fridges for this week. And he brings the snacks in and I'm helping him unload it. And he's, this is so funny because all my NHL guys basically just asked me for Sour Patch Kids. And mine is like carrot sticks and peanut butter pretzels. And he's like, I think women are a lot more responsible. I was like, oh, you think? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I've been helping with a little bit of everything today. I was like putting laundry loops together, trying to get stuff going. But, but on the volleyball side, I had to recruit the whole team. So having conversations with people who have already been playing professionally was new to me. Recruiting is not new. But talking about income and health insurance and all of these other pieces of what you can be provided through this league, that was very new to me. And really convincing people, like I said before, hey, don't go to Europe. Come here. Do something that we don't even have a schedule for yet. Take the risk and be a part of it. And I'm sure some of the other coaches can attest to this, but it wasn't hard. There's so much interest. I remember when I, got the job officially, Jen Spiker told me, I'm going to send you a list of interested players so that you don't feel so behind in the recruiting. And I said, okay, you know, sounds good. And she sends me this list and I'm expecting 50, 50 people. It was 300 people deep, 300 people who have reached out to her to say, I want to be a part of this league. And so there's a lot of interest it, it was fun to have those conversations and inform people about what we're doing. And that's what my first few months were. And now it's just about coming down to Orlando and going to some event and getting the buzz going for the city. Yeah, absolutely. So what will the, you said about a month, uh, a little over a month out, I believe, um, from first match, maybe a month and a half, but what does that look like from everybody just reporting, literally just reporting to training? What does a training camp look like for year one? Uh, every team was allowed to have what we're calling a mini, a mini training camp, which mm -hmm. is three days long. And some teams had theirs in November. I know Omaha Grand Rapids, they're just getting started with theirs. And mine is this week. And so that really just consisted of you can plan however you want, but it was a max of three days. And that was one of the things that us coaches insisted on having before the college draft. We said, we want to be able to evaluate our team. We want to know what our team needs are before we head into drafting these college players because we want our draft picks to be realistic. We want them to be people yeah. that can contribute and make the roster or be a part of this practice roster that we're allowed. So December and November was really, uh, for me, it's about getting to know my team, see what kind of rhythm we can get in and what kind of offense we can run and see if there's any additions or changes that we need to make. In January, right now, it's pretty similar to college. So everybody has a specific report day, which is based off of their first game. So it's 21 days prior to their first match, and then you have all of your training time leading up to your first match. And there's some required days off in there, which I think is great. You know, we're setting some standards yeah. of care for our athletes and taking care of them. But for the most part, yeah, that three weeks is it's going to be a grind and you got to figure out what you have. And most teams are going to have to make some cuts along the way, which I know is going to be the dagger in my heart because it's just hard. I can't even think about it yet. That's going to be the tough part, but I'm just excited to this week to finally get in the gym and play some volleyball. Yeah. Get, put the administrative stuff away and do what you truly love. I want to uh, piggyback on that, that a little bit, because not only with this league and not only with you being a head coach, just talk about with the explosion of volleyball, the last five to seven years, Talk about the greater opportunities for females, not only with head coaching positions at more major programs, at professional programs. Talk about that, um, that movement, which is long overdue, and what that does for females in the game or wanting to stay in the game. I think it's great to have female role models. 
I'll be pretty honest. I'm not that person that says you only should hire females. I think that there are many qualified men out there who are just as great of leaders and role models and family people who do really wonderful things for young women. But I played for a woman coach who taught me to be tough and gritty. And I think the more the merrier, because it's just showing us that nothing can really stand in your way. If you have goals and you want to achieve them, it's you can be a woman and break down those barriers. So I think seeing women in powerful roles and making it to those matches on TV and seeing them and seeing Danny and her red yeah. blazer out there coaching, there's something that does that to you. You get a little pumped up about it and I can't help but root for them more than the men. <laughs> but I just think it's great to get the coverage. And again, the more women we see doing it at a higher level, yes. I think will spark women to want to be coaches. Because I think that there is still that stipulation of maybe you don't make enough money, go do something else, or the grind is too hard and you can't have kids. But we see women really changing the narrative with that and having kids and traveling that and getting the help they need from their administration. And so it's really great to see that part change in the last few years. And I hope more young girls coach camps and people are ready to take on those roles after college or after they're done playing. And we've even done that, uh, like with VB Adrenaline. We have a uh, uh, internship program for college players that want to pursue a career in sports broadcast. And the reason we started with that was because years ago, I looked and I always had the phrase of, it's like they grabbed a basketball announcer to do the volleyball match. And that just didn't make it entertaining but yet there weren't opportunities. I remember talking with Kathy DeBoer a couple of years ago and she's like, Aaron, that, that doesn't pay enough for them to do that as their career. So their needs, be more education, more opportunities, more training. And little by little, we're getting there. And there are people that are passionate because I think you can do a better job as an announcer if you're educated and passionate about what you're talking about. Yeah, I, we saw um, Leah Edmond did the Kentucky matches this weekend yeah. and yeah. Kayla One did the pit matches this weekend. I know Logan Eggleston did a Texas match early on in the year and I thought they did a pretty good job of not being too biased towards their teams either. They just kind of talked volleyball and yeah. did it for the average Joe who's just tuning in, but also for all of the young volleyball players that look up to them. And so I, I loved having a former player on there. And that's why I think Katie George does a really good job too. She, I love listening to her and I think they do a good job. Uh, yeah. And you look at some of the, now you're starting to get figures like Courtney, Sportney Lyle, as she goes by on Instagram. I love that name. And then Emily with Big Ten Network, you're putting them faces like you do with, I hate to say it, like a Dick Vitale or a Jim Nance. Or they go, oh, she's on all the yeah. Big Ten matches. Or And I think we're making strides. And it's better, um, in my opinion, it's better entertainment. But uh, let's go on that. I wanted to ask you with the league. And so entertainment, because it is a professional league, and a big part of things that maybe make the NBA different, the NFL different, is the entertainment that goes on when you go to a game. Anything special that you know of with the league? Um, a, will there be television or some things like that for the average fan who might go to a match? I can't speak on television because as much as I like to think I'm involved in everything, I have not been involved in that one. <laughs> But I know that they're working on it, and I hope we hear soon. I'm hopeful. I know uh, Dave Winham and Steve Evans, the founders, have been working on that for a long time. And so it, I know it's there. It's in their back pocket. They just haven't shared it yet. In terms of in-game experience, I know one big change from the NCAA is noisemakers will be allowed. And so if you can imagine soccer games and places that really drum, literally drum up noise, which you'll see in a lot of Greece is crazy. If you go to a match in Greece, you know, it's like, or Puerto Rico, it's so fun and so loud. And so I think that will be a change for normal volleyball fans, but I think it'll make it a little bit more exciting because there will be 
some interactive things going on during the game. But I, I believe every organization is doing their research into what makes the games exciting, how to have fan fan engagement, how to have DJs, really make it this like party atmosphere and so that you really feel like you're having a good time at the match. Absolutely. Talk about uh, the trends with volleyball right now and some of, you know, I guess I focus more on uh, prep and college, but uh, talk about things, your thoughts on the explosion, what's good and maybe what are some things you would like to see continue to be addressed and improved? The good news is that it's not slowing down <laughs> uh, okay. from the club level and just seeing even high school participation. I think everybody expected us to peak and then people stopped playing, but it hasn't stopped. Every year we're still the, the team that has or the sport that has the most participants. The clubs are growing at outrageous numbers. I'm in the Orlando area right now and I was meeting with somebody and there's five clubs just in this area alone. And they, they all field like 30 teams. I'm like, that's so cool because it doesn't matter what level they are. They're getting an experience and they're getting to play the sport, which is the most important thing. We all know that sports is life lessons and that's what it should be. With that said, some of the things that I would like to see change when it comes to growing the game, I would like to see more. Uh, what's the term? More like personality profile, actually highlighting the players as we yeah. continue to grow our media coverage and with u utilizing socials better. I think that there can be a better emphasis on players and what who they are, what's their story. I think every year during the final four, we see the same five minute segment about the same kid 20 times. And it's no, there's, there are so many stories from starters to bench warmers that can be highlighted and, and they shouldn't be ignored. And somebody just has to take the time to do that research. So, so we need a couple more Emily's and, uh, Michaela's out there, or I think that's how you pronounce her name Chester to highlight those athletes because they're out there and I think they'll be captivating and they'll help grow the sport even more. Well, that's good because our tagline literally is telling the athlete's story. So I feel like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where there are TV cameras just aren't as big as that other station, but we're getting there. And I, and I totally believe it because it's that engagement of playing against somebody in club. You look at Kari Spears, who's number one, in the country a Texas commit now, but girls that play against her can connect when they go to college and when they watch her more on TV and they're like, I played against her. And, oh, you remember that one time she hit the ball off your nose and, and but that sounds goofy, but basketball was all the AAU circuit and you knew the Kobe Bryant's coming up and then they continued to talk about it. And I think you're right. The faces of volleyball and promoting them, but having them stay here home and play professional is just going to help because talk about that, the college stars and the Olympic stars, and then they're staying here and playing during the pro season. So they're on TV or you can go to a match that's got to help the popularity. I would think and be the goal. Oh yeah. And I think especially with uh, NIL stuff happening in, it's happening in high school now. And so if they can continue to have a platform to keep their current fan base engaged when they go play professionally, they almost already have a built-in little network. Uh, so I think it's yeah. great. I know that there are some boundaries that I think need to be set on NIL, but I'm here for it. And I think it does nothing but provide opportunities and then just having this league is going to continue to do the same thing. And so I think it's a good time for players in the U.S. to capitalize on pro volleyball here and continue to capitalize on the platforms that they have. I know you're just getting into the coaching part, the X and O and the training, but the big difference between being that, account, that college coach and now being a professional coach. Yeah, I've been asked this question a couple of times and I don't think it's that different. I, I think I'm pretty lucky to have spent some time with Brad Keller at SC and learn some of the systems that he's used from USA volleyball, men's volleyball. And we you know we implemented it quite a bit at SC. Sometimes it failed, 
you get it. No one has to jump on our backs, but it's, uh, <laughs> I think professionally, you have a little bit more depth to try some of those things, to utilize the back, the back row attack. Uh, so a quick back row attack or a D ball, which is behind the setter and really have a more powerful offense. You see a couple of teams in college doing it right now and starting to get really good at it. And that's, I, I think it's just the biggest change for me is going to be that you have a roster full of extremely talented individuals. In college, maybe your depth isn't always there, but in this, I'm looking at my roster and I'm going, you guys are legit and we got to figure out how to utilize every single one of you. And so it's going to be a fun challenge, but not one that I'm scared of or worried about. Talk to the, a lot of our followers are in that prep ranks now, but just talk about the difference. A, if you could training wise club to college, but then even college to pro, what is the difference Ooh. from a training aspect? That's interesting. Um, I think a lot of clubs do a great job and I think a lot of clubs still worry about the wrong things. It's the same thing I'm sure in college and the same thing professionally. And if we could streamline that and continue to educate from top to bottom and so that it is better from bottom up, I think it'll only help our sport. But I think in club, we still get a little bit too wrapped up with uh specializing a player is, is one of the issues that we're now seeing at the higher levels. When our athletes leave, they aren't necessarily prepared to play six rotations and pass and defend because they've never had to. So I would love for the clubs to train the full athletes and to not just worry about what's going to help you win the 14 gold bracket. Worry about how you're developing your athletes and the same can be said in college where we have some unique rules in the U.S. about how many substitutions we can make. And I get it. I understand it. It provides opportunities. It allows you more people on your roster. But take the time in the spring and in the beginning of the year to really test those athletes to see if they can do more than just hit the ball or do more than just pass. See if there's more to them. Um, and then in professionally, I think what I'm learning just from, you know, I've been talking to my athletes a lot over the last few months about things that they would like to see and things that are different. And I think that there is when you're, you know, when you're in college, you're limited to such amount of hours. And so when you do all of your individual practices, it's still at the same time as everyone else. And here we have way more hours available. There's no, hey, you got to be out of the gym by this time. And so I think there's going to be a lot more individual practices, more slow. Like some of the practices are going to be slower because we just have the time to do it. And then when we get into our six on style, it's going to be very much broken down by, hey, let's stop and watch that play. Were we on the right step at the right time? Were your hands in the right place before she hit the ball? And try to, at least early on, really try to develop the sense of the system that we want to be in and making sure we're pretty accurate in the things that we're requesting of the players to make the whole machine function. It's Volleyball is the ultimate team sport. And if you're not doing the right thing at the right time, then it's going to show. And luckily in the pro life, I think you get more time to iron some of those kinks out. Yeah, to perfect, to perfect the little things and the strategy literally. Plus, they know it's more than a one or two year deal. Some of them may play for years and it's taking, it's that body preservation and you don't need to pound them into the ground every single day when exactly. um, the season might be three, four months long. What are some, uh, what has been a joy being part of the college game? I love this. What has been a joy the last five to six years seeing things where you're like, I didn't know if we'd ever get that. <laughs> oh man. I feel like there's so many people. Like I also get asked all the time, do you miss it? Because I was coaching college for 10 years now, which is like so small compared to some of these other coaches. But for me, that was a long time. I left Alabama. I went right to grad school. I actually coached at a high school for a year, but then I went 
right to South Carolina as a grad assistant and then started my coaching career right after that. And we miss the community piece of being at a university. I think that there is there's nothing like college towns. And I've been very fortunate to be at schools where sports is important. In the grand scheme of what have I enjoyed with volleyball, man, I, I mean, there's been even a couple this year. I cried watching the Nebraska game, <laughs> watching the outdoor game. I was like, I never in a million years would have thought something like that happened. Um, seeing a game on ESPN more than one time a year. So I think that there are things that when I played and even early in my coaching career, I never anticipated happening and seeing it fold in front of us. It just, it makes me really proud to be a part of the sport. So, yeah. No, those are all great. And I, I didn't realize it being a newcomer. Um, we're in well, the Midwest where Big Ten volleyball rules and especially Nebraska and then you and I talked about Sioux Falls, where Bergen is from. So we're watching. And as I watched it, I had the same thing. I have these chills. And I'm like, realize that in a goofy way, you were watching part of history. Uh, and I thought about people that had put their whole life into the sport, pinching themselves and being like the first color football game, the first Super Bowl, things like that. It had yeah. that kind of feel to it. Yeah, it did. Um a little bit of a kind of related, a little bit of a tangent, but I played basketball growing up. So my, I'm from Chicago. Obviously, that's a volleyball community as well. But my dad, I was a basketball player and I always thought I would go to University of Illinois to play basketball. That was my thing. I'd gone to camp since I was in like fifth grade. So I started, I got really lucky and started my volleyball career at First Alliance, Lions Juniors in Chicago. And I just fell in love with it. And I played AAU basketball and club volleyball and travel softball all the way up until I got to high school. And when I got to high school, my dad was like, we can't do this anymore. You got to pick something. And I walked in and I was like, okay, I'm going to play volleyball. And I think his jaw hit the floor because it was like, oh, what about basketball? You could be so good at it. And I was like, I don't know. I just, I really like this volleyball thing. I'm really into it. So I kept playing all, every sport through uh, high school. I didn't play softball. I played badminton, fun fact. But my sophomore year, I, my dad kind of asked me again because we needed to start doing some recruiting things. And he said, well, let's start getting some letters together for basketball. And I said, I'm going to play volleyball in college. And he looked at me and he was like, 5'3". Who do you think you are that you're going to go play volleyball in college? And I was like, I, not only am I going to play, Dad, I'm going to get a scholarship. And if you know me at all, I was that sassy to my father. <laughs> so he, we made a bet and he was like, okay, you know, if, if you're going to get a scholarship, I'll buy you any car you want. So I went and I ripped out a picture of this Mercedes out of a magazine and stuck it on my fridge. And on my 21st birthday, I didn't get a Mercedes, but I did get a new Jeep. So <laughs> it's a good trade off. <laughs> hey, at the time, that was a win. Absolutely. But even back then, that's why I say I'm really proud of the sport because I feel like there have been so many women that have come before me, but I, I do feel like I was right at that cusp of like, it's changing. Like people are leaving basketball to go play volleyball. And I was right there with this. It's just such a special sport. I can't step away from it. And I'm really lucky to be a part of it. And you and I talked about the community that it brings and the coaches and the players. And it's special. It's really cool to be a part of volleyball. The thing I notice and people have asked um, when I started just trying to promote volleyball in South Dakota eight years ago with a little Twitter account and just trying to get people to follow it and literally calling out other media stations like, hey, why aren't you in this gym? Why, why don't you do, why don't we have a first five for volleyball, blah, blah, blah. What I notice now, uh, and it goes with called the Bergen Riley effect here in South Dakota, but the best athletes before the tallest girls, the best athletes were automatically basketball players. Yeah. The, that it, it, at least here and we're behind, especially in the Midwest, it's not that way anymore. 
um, where you're starting to see more and more of them have volleyball as a priority. Um, and you can say whatever you want, specializing one sport, multiple sports, whatever, but having it be the focus and what they put the majority of their time into, that has tra- changed so drastically in the Midwest the last few years. Um, you're seeing that where the best athletes are more and more of them are playing volleyball, which gets me to this question. I'm getting a little scared because I'm not a huge fan of the men's game. I apologize because I think the net is just way too low and guys shouldn't be able to jump three feet over the net. So I'm getting worried as all these ballers, like the prep shout out, will give it a little bit when they're starting to touch 10, eight, 10, nine uh, in the sophomore year of high school. Are we going to explode? Are we just going to out jump the net height in women's volleyball here pretty soon? No, I don't Good. think so. I think the 10 nines of the world are pretty rare. And I think women's volleyball, one thing that makes us unique and different than men's volleyball is the skill. I, know I And that could be because of the physicality in men's volleyball. So, you know, the serve and pass and the defense is a little bit different, but we're watching Nebraska and Wisconsin play each other who have huge people at the net, great athletes. And we're also seeing amazing rallies. And so even though the athleticism and the jump numbers and touches might be going up, I think we're still going to get those great rallies. That's not going to change in women's volleyball. And even if it does a little bit, I, I don't think it's enough to swing us all the way over to the men's side. Uh, which is in itself is impressive the things they do over there. But I, I think women's yes. volleyball is going to stick with their gritty. You got to serve and pass. You got to defend. And that's why it's so exciting. What is exciting. I love the rallies. Uh, the bro is, that's the first possession position I kind of focused on because I can watch one thing and getting down and dirty and diving. I'm all about that. Um, yeah. I never, I don't think there would have been any front row players in my family. So we're all, we're all liberal fans here for sure. But Talk to us as we wrap up and thank you so much for your time, but talk about what can we do? Where do you go? Look for tickets. Again, talk about the important dates uh, with the real pro volleyball and um, talk a little bit about the college, uh, the college selection draft that you touched on earlier. Yeah. So the first Orlando Valkyries match is January 26th. We got a home match to kick off our season. The first real pro match is in Omaha. I think it's very fitting. I am jealous of them, of course, for being the first, but why not do it in Omaha with that amazing fan base? And that is January 24th. They play the Atlanta vibe. So every team play away and home twice per opponent. So you'll get some opportunities to see your favorite team a couple times, no matter what city you're in. Playoffs will start in May and it'll be the top four teams. So it's going to be a battle. I think that we're going to get to a point in the middle of the year when maybe we start separating ourselves a little bit, but I think down to the wire, every game is going to be important, which will make it just more fun and more intense and then for our college draft which is oh my gosh it's next monday already december 11th um (laughs) yeah we have five rounds well seven picks because there are seven teams five five picks per team so 35 picks and oh i i haven't talked to the other coaches too much you know there's some gamesmanship going on of course but I can speak to every conversation that I've had with a potential FD, nothing but excitement. And yeah. just, really, you know, I lay it out for them. I try to be as transparent as possible about you could make the active roster, you could make the practice roster, or you could not make anything at all. And the answer is always, I'll be it. So we've gotten some really positive feedback from the players. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. Of course, it's year one. We're a startup. There's going to be some growing pains, but I think that we're doing things the right way and people are excited to be a part of it. Oh man, I'm pumped. That might be how I make my mark. I might start the first um, fantasy volleyball league um, with the draft and we just follow it all the way through. You guys are like a dynasty league in real <laughs> life. So <laughs> if you're a fantasy geek, then 
I totally am pumped about that, especially when you're drafted over. Some may be in the final four, so still playing, but exciting times. I want to thank you so much for your time uh, and excited. Uh, just is there a, a league website or your guys' website? Where's the best place people can go to purchase tickets? Uh, OrlandoValkyries.com to purchase our tickets. And you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter. We're always putting promotions out. There's a huge holiday pack going on right now. And so grab your tickets and all that stuff will be rolling throughout the year. I actually met with the ticketing people when I got in today and they were telling us, they were telling me about their promotion ideas. And so I think there's some fun ones to come too during the year. So keep an eye out. We love it. We absolutely will keep an eye out. And with that, we're going to go into our prep shout out of the week. And on the podcast uh, from VBAdrenaline.com, one of the player profiles, Nadia Johnson, you brought up, coach, you brought up Metro Volleyball earlier. is a 2026 opposite. And just touched 10 foot eight, saw her film this week, and she's already camped at Louisville and Baylor. So a huge year ahead for Adadia. Wanted to give her a shout out. Make sure if you're on the East Coast, you're watching her and her Metro teammates. Very talented club uh, coming out. So that's our prep shout out of the week. And you can read more about recruiting and player profiles and in-depth one-on-one interviews with some of the top prospects in the country on vbadrenaline.com and check us out. We'd love to have you, but that's going to wrap up this edition, volleyball fans, at another one of the VB Adrenaline podcast. If you want to keep the conversation going, connect with us on social media. Instagram is at vbadrenaline.com underscore and on the X at vbadrenaline. You can share your top moments from today, talk about players, talk about the pro league, questions for coach. We'll send them on her way and we'll be back soon with another episode to talk rising stars, all things volleyball in this growing popular sport. Coach, thanks for your time and everybody that's going to do it for today. Take care.